Yep, I put a blank slide in there. That's my brain this morning. So first thing I wanna talk about is just simple probability. And one of the things that we are going to analyze in this is what is called the gambler's fallacy. And I misspelled that, probably. A game of roulette involves spinning a wheel that has 38 slots. 18 of them are red, 18 of them are black, and two of them are green. A ball is spun in the wheel and it'll eventually land in a slot where each slot has an equal chance of capturing the ball. This is um, important for the purposes of analyzing probability. It's the chances have to be equal or you've got to have some way to proportionalize them. So you watch the wheel eight times and the ball was red every single one of the eight times. What is the probability that it's gonna land on red the next time? Well, here's the big thing with this question. All spins are independent of each other. Okay, therefore it does not matter what I got on the previous result to figure out what my probability for my next result is. So you know, the probability of getting a red is the number of red ball, uh, the number of red slots divided by the total number of slots. And we are going to keep our probabilities as decimals. The homework has you go to four decimal places. So I'm just gonna stick that in the calculator, go 18 divided by 38, rounded to four decimal places. I get 0 0.4737. Um, you watch the roulette wheel, it spins 10,000 times and it landed on black every single one of those 10,000 times in a row. What is the probability that it'll land on red on the next slot? No, the next time around. Well, the gambler's fallacy says that, hey, if it's done 10,000 times in a row that it got black, it's going to get black next time. But that's a fallacy because we have an equal chance of each slot capturing the ball. And I'm going to, again, the number of reds divided by the total numbers, and I get the same probability. So uh, you'll see, if you go to casinos, you'll see people that'll watch the roulette thing and say, well, they just had a really long black streak, so I'm going to bet on red next time because it's, it's had so many blacks, it's got to be red this time. Okay, That's just wishful thinking on their parts. That's why it's a fallacy. Um, the probability on a fair roulette wheel, which they're supposed to be um, – the gaming commissions actually do hundreds of thousands of spins on the wheel, and then they make sure it does have a nice even distribution. Um, but there can be just flukes and randomness. You know, you can get black for 50 times in a row, and the next one will be red, or the next one will be green. So simple probabilities, you just take the number of things that are available, divided by the total number, and that's going to give you your simple probabilities. This is expanding a little bit more with some of the stuff we did the other day. What is the probability of the top card of a shuffled deck of playing cards being the ace of hearts? Well, we asked ourselves, how many aces of hearts do I have in a deck of cards? One, how many cards are there in a deck of cards? 52. So the probability of getting the ace of hearts being on the top of the deck of cards is 0 0.01. Nine, two. That would also be the same probability for getting any individual card that's in the deck of cards. So the next one expands on this a little bit. Okay. What is the probability of it being an ace or a heart? 
So we ask ourselves, how many aces do I have in the deck? I have four of them. I ask myself, how many hearts do I have in the deck? I have 13 of them. And then I have to subtract the ace of hearts from it, and there is one of those. And the reason why I'm subtracting that ace of hearts is because I counted it with the aces, I counted it with the hearts, so I need to subtract it so I don't double count. So four plus 13 is 17, minus one is 16, 1650 seconds. And that gives us approximately 0 0.3077. For the probability of getting an ace or a heart. So, um, no, we do not do percentages for deaths for for these, um, because we saw in the last lecture our probabilities have to be between zero and one. So that's why we're going to keep on representing these things as decimals. If you type in, if you convert it to a percentage and type that in for an answer in the homework system or on your test, it's going to kick it back and say it's wrong. So make sure you do these in decimals. And I'm going to erase what looks like part of an extra decimal point there. Okay, it looks like the last... Okay, so this is just a little bit longer problem that I have to look at. Pew Research surveyed 2,373 randomly sampled registered voters of political affiliation, Republican, Democrat, or Independent, and whether or not they identify as swing voters. So they asked two questions. They asked for their political affiliation, and they asked whether or not they were swing voters. 35% identified as independent. Why did those question marks show up there? 23% um, identified as swing voters and 11% identified as both. And in this case, the both are independent and swing voters. So are being independent and being swing voters disjoint? Is it mutually exclusive? Okay, and I'm going to tell you that this is a no because they told us right here that they identified as both. So if you have things that overlap, they are not mutually exclusive. It says draw a Venn diagram summarizing the variables and the associated probabilities. So I have the two questions I have. I have... Um, So the one, what, what I'm doing is independent. So I have whether or not we're independent and whether or not we're a swing voter. So this is, are we a swing voter? This is, are we independent? So let's look at this. 35% um, identified as independent. So independent is 35%. Okay, 23% identified as swing, and 11% identified as both. So what I want to do is fill out this Venn diagram so that I have the percentages for these things. So both is 11. Okay, the rest of the independent has to add up to 35, so this portion of the Venn diagram would be 24. The rest of the swing has to add up to 23, so this portion would be 12. Once I have that information, I can go answer the rest of the questions. What percentage of voters are independent, but not swing voters? That would be the 24%. What percentage are independent or swing voters? Okay, this would be independent, plus swing minus both. So that would be 35 plus 23 minus 11. So that gives me 58 minus 11, 
47. What percentage are neither independent nor swing voters? Okay, and that would be the opposite of question D. So 100% people, we've already accounted for 47%, so that means the remaining 53% would be this one. Okay, now here's the deal on that answers this the chat question. If I ask you for a percent, you give me a percent. If I ask you for a probability, you're gonna give me that decimal to four decimal points. Is the event that someone is a swing voter independent of the event that someone is politically independent? And again, this is just another way to answer, ask the question that was asked in part A. Does anybody have any questions on how I calculated any of those numbers and, or how I got the information for the Venn diagram? Okay, next. Guessing on an exam. In a multiple choice exam, there are five questions and four choices for each question. Standard multiple choice tests. I have five questions and I have four choices for each question. Nancy has not studied for the exam at all and decides to randomly guess the answers. What is the probability that the first question she gets right is the fifth question? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at each question um, and we're going to figure out the probability of meeting the choices for the question. So for A, in order for her to get the first, the fifth one right as the first one, that means questions number one, two, three, and four have to be wrong. Okay, there's a 25% chance that she guesses that the right answer. That means there is a 75% chance that she guesses the wrong answer. So the probability of getting for this one is 0.75. This one would be 0 0.75, 0 0.75, 0 0.75. And the last one being correct would be 0.25. So to get the answer to answer A, I am going to enter 0.75 to the fourth times 0.25 and that will tell me the probability that the first question she gets right is the fifth question. So I'm gonna go 0.75 to the fourth. Make sure you use the right arrow to come out from exponents and then hit times 0.25 and I get approximately 0 0.0791. Now, if I look at those numbers, the way I have the 0.75s and the 0.25, it does not matter whether it was the fifth question she got right or if I rephrase question A, what is the probability of getting exactly one right? I am going to have the exact same probability because I could have the one question one be the 0.25, then everything else is 0.75. I could have the question three be the 0.25 with everything else is the 0.75. Okay, so I just answer, okay, so um, that is getting exactly one right. So now B, what is the probability that she gets all of the questions right? So for B, my list of probabilities are going to be 0.25 for all of them. And I ask myself the question, put it in the calculator as 0.25 to the sixth. And, um, My calculator gave me this. That will not be accepted in um, 
the homework thing. So I have to convert it from scientific notation to the decimal. That to the negative fourth means I need to move the decimal point four spaces to the left. So one, two, three, four. Here's my decimal. Put the rest in as zeros. And then I'm going to write down the four decimal points I need. I'm going to write approximately 0 0.0002. So that's the likelihood of getting, so it's two hundredths of a percent. So if you have a five question test and all you do is guess, you've got two hundredths of a percent chance of getting them all right, which means that if you do this for 50 tests, you'll finally get them all on average. One of those 50 tests will be all correct. And for part C, she gets at least one question right. So in order to get at least one question right, that means um, she either had zero right, one, uh, no, that means she had one right, two right, three right, four right, or five right to get at least one question right. Well, that corresponds to having zero wrong, one wrong, two wrong, three wrong, or four wrong, okay? There is only one other possibility that I have out of this mess. And that is the possibility of getting zero right, which is the same thing as getting one of them wrong. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 100% probability or the number one and minus the probability of getting one wrong. And that's how I'm going to come up with the answer for this one. Well, the probability of getting one wrong, I can pick any one of these to be the wrong one and all the rest of them would be right. So my final answer is gonna be one minus 0.75. Um, times 0.25 to the fourth. So I'm gonna do one minus 0.75 times 0.25 to the fourth. And I get approximately 0 0.0029. That she gets at least one question right. Something's wrong. Zero right, let me go back to my reasoning here. She gets at least one question right. So the only thing that's bad is if she gets zero of them right. Okay. I put a one instead of a zero. So the only thing that's bad is if she gets zero of them right. Zero of them right, these are all 0.75s. So that would be 0.75 to the sixth. Sorry about that. I told you my brain was that blank screen. And the reason why I knew the answer was wrong is because I got like 2%. So one, oh, and I hit a times key too instead of a minus. One minus 0.75 to the sixth. There we go. That one's reasonable. So there's an 82% chance or a 0 0.8220 probability of getting at least one question right. And the way I did that, getting at least one question right is the same thing as not getting everything wrong. So I did one minus the probability of not getting all wrong in order to do this. And I could calculate the probability of getting them all wrong by just doing some straightforward math. 
think we have another example similar to this coming up. Oh, no, next one's conditional probability. So smallpox data set provides a sample of 6,224 individuals from the year 1721 who are exposed to smallpox in Boston. Doctors at the time believed that inoculation, which involves exposing a person's, person to the disease in a controlled form, could reduce the likelihood of death. And I have two data tables. One of them is the raw numbers, and then the other one are my proportions. And the way I got the proportions is you just take the raw numbers and you calculate each of the proportions. For example, 244 divided by 6224 is the 0.0392. So um, if you are given the numbers table, you can calculate the proportion table. If you are given the proportion table and the total number of individuals, you can go back and calculate the numbers table. So for conditional probability, we need a formula here. And I need to find my, what page I'm on. Three through five. There we go. So the formula we're gonna end up using is the probability, let me, I don't like the lime group, whatever, Kelly group. So probability of A and B happening. Okay, the out two outcomes or events is the probability of A given B. This line right here is the word given. So A given B has already occurred times the probability of event B. And you're gonna, you're gonna see us use this formula to get some examples. So an example of the probability of A given B would be that they lived given that they were inoculated. Okay? So probability of lived given inoculated, in our case, they lived and inoculated, that's that probability right there. Okay, the probability of B is whether or not they were inoculated, and that is that one right there. Okay, so that's how we're gonna be able to use this formula and our data tables. So now let's ask ourselves some questions on this. All I did is I copied the slides over and then I have the questions. Write out in formula notation the probability a randomly selected person who was not inoculated died and then find this probability. So the if we go back to this equation, This is the ant, that's what I want right now. I wanna find that probability of A given B. So I'm gonna to have to do a little arithmetic in there. So I know that the probability of, so I'm gonna put not a knock, so, and dying is equal to the probability of inoculated given that they died. And we go back here and then the B on the right hand side is times the probability that they died. I am trying to add, solve for this right now. Somebody who was not inoculated that died, okay? This is a times operation. So for me to isolate this probability of not inoculated given that they died is equal to the and portion. So what is the probability of being inoculated and dying? Um, so inocul uh, not inoculated 
and dying is this one divided by, because I can move this over to the other side, divided by just the probability of dying. And I put that in the calculator, wherever I put my calculator, somebody's eating my calculator. There we go. And I get 0.1356 divided by 0.1366, and I get 99.27. So the probability that a randomly selected person who was not inoculated died is 99.27%. Okay? Determine the probability that an inoculated person died from smallpox. Does this result compare to the above? So determine the probability inoculated died from smallpox. So I'm gonna use a blue pen. So inoculated and died. I'm gonna do the work up here. <clears throat> and that would be P inoculated or die is equal to not or and die and die is equal to the probability of inoculated or die times the probability that they die so the p i and d inoculated and died is this one so this is 0 0.0010 is equal to what I am solving for times the probability of just dying 13.1366. And if I take the 0 0.0010 divided by the 0 0.1366, that will give me. Um, Inoculated person dying. So if I go 0 0.0010 divided by 0 0.1366, I get 0 0.0073. How does this compare to the above results? What do you notice about these two? Is they add up to one. So what we're saying is, um, the first one was non-inoculated people dying. Second one was inoculated people dying. That takes into account all of our people dying. So that gives us our, they have to add up to one to get, cover every person. So this general formula that's right here, you're going to be able to find two pieces of that information readily. Okay? And then you're going to solve for the third one using basic arithmetic. Multiply both sides by the same thing. Divide both sides by the same thing. Stuff like that. Just basic arithmetic. There's another way I could have answered this question. I could have made a tree. Okay? And what I can do is I can... <clears throat> I asked two questions. One, whether or not somebody was inoculated. Okay. So for the people that are inoculated, there were 0 0.0392. So 3.92% were inoculated. 96.08% were not inoculated. Okay. Then what I do is out of the people that were inoculated, I got this, they lived 0382, died 0010. The next one is 0 0.8252, 0 0.1356. Uh, 
Um, that's wrong. We're going to be able to get numbers in a second. So I asked myself, what percentage of people that were inoculated lived? 238 divided by 244, and I think that was they were the right number. So I'm taking 238 divided by 244. That'll tell me what percentage lived. 0.238, no, clear. 238 divided by 244. This is 0.9754. And then I can do the six divided by 244. 0.0259. Um, for the ones that lived for non-inoculations, is the 5136 divided by 5980. And that's 0 0.85, no, 0 0.8589. The died is 844 divided by the 5980. That gives me 0 0.1411. One thing I want you to notice is that every time I have a split on the tree, the two, the two parts of that branch have to add up to one. And now I can use this tree to calculate the following. The probability of living, given that they were inoculated, would be the top number, the 0.9. This is going to be the um, 0.9754 times the 0 0.0392. So 0.9754 times 0 0.0392. Uh, Let me go back to my table. Any other? Let's check that. Oh, what percentage of the people? So now I'm going to be able to calculate. This is going to give me the percentage that meet these requirements. So yeah, that is point up. So point zero three eight two. 0 0.0259 times 0 0.0392. All I'm doing is I'm multiplying the, the numbers that line up together. 0 0.0010, 0 0.8589 0 0 times 0 0.9608, 0 0.8252, 0 0.1411, times 0 0.9608 is 0.1356. And if you notice what numbers I just got were these right here. So there, the table that this this tree that I make is a way is how you are coming up with the information that is on that table, okay? And then that, then you can go back and answer questions. And one of your ones that's exactly like a homework question except for different percentages. Suppose thirteen percent of students earned an A on the midterm. So thirteen percent got an A. That means eighty-seven percent did not get an A. Okay, um, those that earned an A on the midterm, 47 got an A on the final, which means 53% did not get an A on the final. Of those who got less than an A on the midterm, 11% got an A on the final. That means that 89% did not get an A on the final. 
And I can multiply these out on 0.13. So what I want to do is I want to find the probability that a student earned an A on the midterm. So So you randomly pick a final exam and notice the student received an A. So I want to find the probability that they got an A on the midterm, given that I already know that they got an A on the final. That takes us back to this conditional probability equation. Okay, I'm going to be solving for this part again. So the pieces that I need is I need the probability of A on the midterm and A on the final. Okay, and the way I get that is, hey, I've got an A on the midterm, I've got an A on the final, I multiply those two numbers together, that's 0.13 times 0.47, that's 0 0.0611. The other part I need from our formula, so I found this, I'm looking for this, I also need the probability of B, which was my overall probability of getting an A on the final. Okay, and the probability, um, so the probability of getting a final being the A, well, That would be finding these and finding these. Okay, so I've already calculated that top one. And this one is 0.87 times 0.11. Where did that? Midterm A and final A, 0.611, divided by the probability of the final being an A. Okay. So the probability of A being a final is this number plus this number, point, and that gives you 0.1568. So if I want to find my final answer, my probability of A on the midterm and A on the final is equal to the probability of a on the midterm given an A on the final times the probability of A on the final. This is the one I'm solving for. I'm going to make that an X. The A on the final was the 0 0.0611. The left-hand side of this equation is 0 0.1568. Um, actually, I, ba I made them backwards. This is the 0 0.611. This one's the um, 0 0.1568. So my X, the thing I'm solving for is the 0 0.0611 divided by the 0 0.1568. And the probability of that random selection, 0 0.0611 divided by 0 0.1568 is 0 0.3897. So the problem, so I first picked up a final exam, they got an A. What was the probability that they got an A on the midterm? 38%. 
So given that I already knew they had an A, I have a 38 or almost a 39% chance to show that they had an A on the midterm. Other ways I can use this tree. Swaziland has the highest HIV prevalence, prevalence in the world. 25.9% of the population is infected with HIV. So I'm gonna make a little tree here. Are they infected? Yes, which would be 0.259 or no, which would be one minus the 0.259. And that would be 0.741. The ELISA test is one of the first and most accurate tests for HIV. For those carry, who have HIV, the test is 99% accurate. Okay? So, um, and those who do not carry HIV, the test is 92% accurate. If an individual from Swaziland has tested positive, what is the probability that they carry HIV? So the second thing I'm gonna, I'm asking myself when I do this question is uh, whether, um, so infected, this is my test result. So if somebody's infected, the accurate is going to be a positive test. Okay, so 1 minus 0.997 would be 0 0.003. If they don't have HIV, if they're not infected, that means the negative is going to be my accurate test. And then the positive... is 0.74, okay? This right here are called false positives. This group right here are false negatives. So you may see them asking for the number of false positives or negatives in a question. So here's what I got. If an individual from Swaziland tests positive, what is the probability that he carries HIV? So what I need to do is I need to find the overall test positive number, which is going to be the top row. And this row right here, multiply them together and then add them up. So 0.259 times 0.997 is 0 0.2582 and then 0 0.741 times 0 0.074 is 0 0.0548. Add those two things together, 0 0.2582 plus 0 0.0548 and I get 0 0.313. Okay, that is the percentage of people that have tested positive. Now, I want to find, so what I want, I want the probability uh, I want the probability that they are infected given that they test positive. Okay, well, that is equal to the probability of infected and positive. And this is times the probability that they are positive. This is the probability that they're positive. The probability of infected and positive was this first number. Point two five eight two. So my equation I get is point two five eight two equals what I'm trying to find 
times the 0.313, divide both sides by the 0.313, and I get 0.8249. So if an individual has tested positive, what is the probability that they have HIV? 80, about 82%. Andy is looking for ways to make, so here's some more basic probability stuff. Andy's looking for a quick way to make money. He's been trying to make money by gambling. A game of chance, the game costs $2 to pay, play. He draws a card from the deck. If he gets the numbers two through 10, he wins nothing. For any face card, he gets three bucks. For any ace, he gets $5. And if he gets the ace of clubs, he gets an extra $20. So what we want to do is we want to multiply the probability for each event times the amount of money he wins based off of that probability. A two through a 10 um, is going to occur nine thirteenths of the time. And I multiply that times $0.00. A face card is going to happen 3 thirteenths of the time. And I'm going to multiply that by $3. An ace happens 1 thirteenth of the time. And I multiply that times $5. And if he happens to get the ace of clubs, which happens 1 52nd time, that is $20. What I do is I multiply this all out, and this will tell you how much on average he's going to win. Well, if I want to find out what his overall winnings chance is, I'm going to take the $2 he paid minus whatever I get here. So if I go 3 divided by 13 times 3 plus 1 divided by 13 times 5 plus 1 divided by 52 times 20, I get 1.46. Okay, and if I do the, uh, no, I got to do it the other way. It's not two minus, it's the, the thing I got minus the $2 I had to pay. And that gives me negative 54 cents. That means on average, every time he draws a card, he's going to lose 54 cents. So if you ask yourself, is this a good way to make money? Well, it would be if you just happen to be lucky enough to get that one on your first try, the Ace of Clubs, because you get $25 for, and you pay two, so you'd end up with a $23 net, net gain. But on average, you are going to lose 54 cents every time you play this game, which means on average, the house is gonna win 54 cents every time you play the game. Um, I'm going to skip this one. I need to get to binomial probability really quick because we got about nine, ten minutes left. Binomial probability, there are four criteria. Well, there's three. I'm going to call it four. The first one is it has to um, have exactly... Two possible outcomes. So some books say four rules, other books say three. Um, the fourth rule is having two possible outcomes. The one that say three, well, it's in the definition of binomial, but I want you to think of it as four. Each trial has to be independent. Um, the probability of success has to be the same for each trial. A 
and you have to have a fixed number of trials. There is a formula we can use for things that meet these things. Um, a probability for success, when we did the um, randomly guessing on the test question, the probability of success was 25%. And that was constant, and we did five test questions. And the answer to one test question did not depend on the answer of another. I could have actually used this formula to calculate things. So the probability of I'm going to say something equaling x, and you're going to see where this comes from in a second, equals n c x times the probability of success times the num to the number of successes, which is my x, times the probability of failure, times one, my, um, times the number of failures, which would be n minus x. So in this case, n is equal to the number of trials. Um, x is equal to number of um, successes that you want. Probability of success and probability of failure. These two have, they, the probability of success and probability of failure have to add up to one. So I do the probability of success raised to the number of successes times the probability of failure raised to the number of failures. And this right here is why I need you to have your calculator. If to get this NCR, um, I'm gonna do that on the next screen. I'm gonna actually, you're gonna put in numbers. So the NC thing on your calculator, the way you get that is you type the N first. I'm flipping a coin six times. So in this case, my n is equal to six. And I'm asking myself, what is the probability of it getting exactly zero, one, two, three, four, or five or six heads? Well, in the first case, my x is gonna equal zero. My probability of success is 0.5. My probability of failure is 0.5. So to enter this ncx thing, first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna type six. Then you are going to hit um, math button. Then you're going to use your arrows so that you get to the probability table, the probability column. Then you're going to go down to, to where it says NCR. You hit enter. And now what I want to do, so this is supposed to look like um, 6C0, and now I'm going to type the 0 in. And if you use your right arrow now, then you can do times 0.5 to the 0 times 0.5 to the 6. And for this one, I get 0 0.0156. And if I keep on doing that for all of these, 0 0.5 to the 1 times 0 0.5 to the 5, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to go up and paste my new numbers in. 0 0.1, 1, 5. 0 0.0938, change those to twos and fours.
zero point two three four four, and we can continue doing this. Okay, that'll tell you the probability of getting zero things right. One, uh, one, so zero heads, one head, two head, three heads, four heads, five heads, and six heads. And if you were to graph this, you would end up with what would look like a bell curve. Okay. And if you do it six times, what is the probability of getting no more than three? No more than three means that you can get zero, one, two, or three, which means you would add up these four numbers here. So let me do the, the three here. Enter. And that would be a three and a three. And that would be 0 0.3125. So the formula that's up here, you can use it to calculate the probability of getting exactly 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 successes. However, here I wanted to get no more than 3, which would be 0, 1, 2, or 3. There is another shortcut on your calculator to answer the no more than questions. So I want you to click second, and then you're going to click the VARS key, which on top of it says dist. You are going to go down, hit your down arrow key until you get to B, binomial CDF. And then you're going to hit enter. And then it's going to give you things that you're going to fill out. In this case, trials, we're going to put eight. For P, that's your probability of success, you're going to put 0.5. For the X value, you want to put the three. So I'm going to type 8, 0.5, 3. Then I click paste and I hit enter. And it's going to tell me 0 0.3633. If you add hmm. That should have worked. This, oh, the trials is not eight, it's six. Sorry, I was doing one with eight earlier. Yep, this one gives me point six five six three, which is all four of these numbers added up. So you can do them individually, or you can use the binomial CDF function to get your answers. And I'm going to look in here. I just did this. I posted a set of tables, which will give you the exact same thing that binomial CDF does. So you can look up your answer in the table or use that binomial CDF function. Um, this one, I'm going to use the NC. So this one, I would use 12. C7.5 to the seventh times 0.5 to the fifth. Um, supposed probability of college freshmen will graduate is 0.6. Three college freshmen are randomly selected. What is the probability that at most two of these? That would be 3C2.6 to the Oh, no, this one I have to use the binomial CDF. So this one is trials is three. My X is two. And my probability is 0 0.6. You use the calculator for that. And you can answer things from histograms just by adding things up. What fraction of cats weighs less than... 2.5 grams, that would be like 28 plus 31, that's 59, divided by the total cats, which is 47 plus 97, 47 plus 97, 
114. So I do that and that and get answers. So you have a question like this on your test. You just read the approximate numbers on the left and compare them and then get them out of their totals. Sorry that we took the full hour, but um, 